So today I'm going to talk about uh, basically is how to use uh, both control and learning in you know, order to implement some advanced autonomous system. Okay. So before we start to go to details, uh, let's first look at what is the ideal robot system that we would like to have. Okay. So we don't have ideal robot system in, in reality, but we indeed have some, in, in, for example, from the movie. Okay. And from this one, as you can see, uh, the robot is uh, doing some task to help the humans. Okay. And uh, in order to do that, the robot need, need to have some knowledge about, for example, the human's preference, uh, what is the task he is going to do, and uh, maybe some physics or mathematics knowledge. And besides that, uh, the robots also need to know some data, okay? for example, about the human's motion, uh, some measurements about the environment, and also uh, some signals of the success or failure. And by using both knowledge and data, the robots can finish the tasks. Okay? So for example, different tasks. So here you, you can see that the robots need to do many tasks. So some of the tasks need very high accuracy, okay? for example, to assembly. And some of the tasks uh, need a relatively low accuracy, but you need to have some deep thinking about what is going on and so on and so forth. And some other task, you need a very fast response, uh, but the middle level accuracy and sort. Okay, so there are many different tasks. So in order to solve or to implement such kind of uh, robot systems, we have different approaches. So one community is the control community. Okay, so basically is what they are doing is that they are used uh, knowledge, okay, which is the most important for them, and also some data in order to uh, enhance the future operation of a dynamic system. Okay, so if you are going to look at the images, so I have some knowledge, and uh, I focus on the modeling and the controller and to design the controller, and then uh, if I have the model and the controller, they can interact with each other, and in this procedure, I can generate some data, and this data can use it to update the model and to tune the controller. Okay, so this is uh, the control community. And also we have the learning community, in particular the reinforcement learning. So uh, for re reinforcement learning, what they, are doing, what they are doing is that they are use a lot of data, okay, and some knowledge to do the same thing. Okay, so if you look at the figure, it's similar. So we may, don't, we don't, we may have no knowledge or a few knowledge about model, and the controller, and we just uh, let the robot to uh, interact with the environment, and then you can collect a lot of data, okay? And then you can uh, tune the uh, controller and also learn the model. And uh, for sure, you can also inject some knowledge about the modeling and the design into the controller model. So this is uh, the reinforcement learning uh, community. And we can see that they are almost the same, okay? So they are almost doing the same thing. Uh, so then we can ask questions. So are the learning scientists and the control engineers, they know each other well, and, uh, and how they are thinking about each other. So actually, this is the main motivation of my talk. Okay, so why I choose this topic. So then let's see some, 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 some like comments. Okay, so this is uh, uh, some complaints from some control engineer. Okay, so this is, I just came them from, uh, from the Zhifu, which is the Chinese version of Quora. Okay. This is very, like, uh, very recently, like uh, December 18th. And uh, it gets one, uh, almost 2,000 likes and also uh, 300 uh, comments. So this is uh, some guy, he is a control engineer. Okay. He got a control PhD in the uh, US. Uh, he worked in some car factory before. And uh, he is working on developed advanced control algorithms. Okay. And these algorithms uh, indeed works. However, uh, his feedback from the CTO is that uh, you don't know too much control, but you know some optimization and the data science. That's, that's it. He, he doesn't like that because uh, he is not some optimization or data science people. Okay. So then he left the company and then he joined uh, some autonomous driving startup. Okay. This is a very hot reason today. Uh, so then he found that the control theory is uh, uh, despised there. Okay. Uh, in that company, only planning, vision, and learning are considered as advanced topics, and the modeling and the control design uh, are not. Okay? So he tried to talk with some planning engineer. So then he found that uh, even though planning is very close to the control, 
But the plain and yes, they also think control is uh, useless. And then nobody cares about the control theory. Okay? And then he uh, complains that the vision community, okay, so the vision community is uh, even more arrogant and they don't respect the, the safety issues and they don't respect any experience in control and so on and so forth. Okay? And then he complained that learning people, okay, learning people that are just the primary tuning, uh, they have some idea and then they tune the parameters and then they, they write papers. Uh, that's it. And, uh, and uh, also he complained that the robotics community, okay, the CV and the planning community, they use ROS, okay? So this is not good because if you want to move into industry, uh, you need to use the C++ code, uh, which is generated uh, automa uh, automatically uh, by the MATLAB or Simlink. Uh, so this is, uh, th you have some guarantee in industry. And uh, he also complained that some people, uh, uh, his friend uh, interviewed uh, in Waymo and also required uh, uh, the, the skill in C++ and Python, not MATLAB. Okay. okay, his conclusion is that uh, control is, uh, is king, okay? Because uh, control, you have uh, the mathematics guarantee and also uh, much better uh, uh, than, than learning. So this is uh, so, some, some, uh, some, uh, some comments I collected from Zhihu. Okay. So as you can see, uh, in reality, the learning people and the control scientists, uh, they, even though they are very close to each other, they don't know each other well enough. Okay? So actually, they look down upon each other. So from what, what he said, uh, apparently, uh, he didn't... Uh, 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 like appreciate you know, the learning, and also you know, from his experience, uh, appearance, apparently you know, the learning people you know, does not appreciate what he's doing. Okay, so there are several reasons for that. First of all, uh, even though they are the same thing, actually you know, they are they have different uh, biases. Okay, so if you are you if you get a PhD or, or like a uh, degree from the ME department or EE, then you can you, you like the control theory, but uh, you only know a bit about the, the reinforcement learning. But if, if you get a PhD from CS, then you may uh, like know a lot about uh, reinforcement learning, but uh, uh, don't know too much about control. And uh, uh, for the control theory, they, they focus more about the continuous uh, dynamics, and also they uh, focus a lot about model. And uh, for the CS, uh, we actually care uh, much more about the, the data than the, than the model, okay? And we mostly, we only care about the discrete dynamics. Uh, robotics actually want to uh, unify both, both parts. Okay, so we we'll see, like in our examples. And also there are some biases in task. So for control, uh, they, they focus more on the industry applications. And uh, for the learning, they focus more on, for example, on the driving, or on some grasping, or on manipulation tasks. So they're different. Uh, however, uh, robotics actually covers the both regions. Okay, you need to do where in both tasks. Finally, uh, these two committees, they have different biases uh, in the criteria. Okay, so this is actually the most important difference between the control and the, and the learning. Uh, for control, so uh, what they care the most about is the guarantee. Okay, for example, the, whether the system is stable, whether they are robust to the, to the noises, and uh, uh, they also care about uh, some dynamic performance, like overshooting, oxidation, uh, convergence rate, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, these kind of guarantee only work for the low-level tasks, okay? And for learning community, so the, uh, we care more about the intelligence, so i.e., so can we learn everything from scratch, or can we uh, learn something which is much more advanced than modeled from scratch, or from data, okay? And also we care about the trade-off between different uh, parameters and the different factors, okay? And uh, we also care about how to use uh, very rich sensory signals like images or videos and so on and so forth. Okay? And, and finally, uh, so uh, the learning want to solve the high level tasks, for example, the autonomous driving and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is uh, uh, the criterion bi biases. And uh, more than robotics actually want to uh, want both. So this is uh, like uh, we want both. We want both guarantee and intelligence. Okay. Okay. So then uh, we we have explained the difference between these two committees, and then uh, the next one is that okay. So why we need to combine them? Uh, the reason is uh, very simple. So uh, uh, the control or learning, they 
uh, they cannot solve the entire problem okay, by themselves. So for example, the control, uh, they, they need a very time-consuming uh, manual procedure to design and to model the system. And it is an art. And it is difficult to leverage uh, very rich sensor data, like image or video. And there's a huge gap between the theory and the applications. So this is uh, uh, the main problem of control. And for learning, uh, so there are also some limitations. For example, you need a very large train data. And also, uh, there's no guarantee about the convergence or the parameter tuning. Okay? And uh, usually, the learned, control, uh, the, the learned controller can only uh, work in a low speed. So it is difficult to match uh, the requirements in industry. Okay. And uh, uh, the, 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 the final uh, limitation actually is that so they are limited in the non-industrial applications, some toy, 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 like, uh, like uh, tasks. Okay. So here is one example that's the reinforced learning. Okay? So reinforced learning, usually we are doing some, for example, end-to-end -end, uh, procedure. So we get some sensor data, and then uh, we uh, put data into some sub-data into some very large neural network, and then we can c get some control policy. Uh, but we have some many like, draw, uh, drawbacks for this kind of procedure. So it is difficult to transfer to, from simulation to real world. Uh, it requires a large number of training data, and also the uh, does not uh, use many structural knowledge about the task, okay? And uh, also limited to the toy, toy tasks, okay? So f here I list uh, one of the examples. For, the, for example, uh, you can do grasping. However, if your grasping does not have a very high accuracy, it is almost uh, useless because uh, only the following manipulation is useful, okay? So then you indeed uh, require very high accuracy for grasping. So this is... Uh, 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 some limitations for the, for the IR. Okay, so then let's see. So how can we combine uh, both the control and the learning? So there are, so there are many ways to do that, okay? Uh, so the, the, the travel way is that, okay, we just can consider control and the learning as black boxes, okay? So for example, I have some original control algorithms, okay? It is not intelligent enough, okay? I can add some I algorithms to provide a high-level policy, okay? This R, this R algorithms may use some deep learning to, for example, to extract features uh, from the images and so on and so forth. Okay, the R is not stable, so then we can add some robust control, and uh, then there are some recent work so that you can improve the R procedure to make it stable. Okay, as you can see, so this kind of uh, black box principle uh, is very convenient. However, it is not always a good solution, okay? And sometimes it will fail, and most time it will fail, okay? So our uh, solution is that uh, in order to uh, solve real world problems, which is uh, very complicated, so what you need is that you need to rethink your tasks and to rethink your problems much deeper than you are. And then you can understand what is the core problem to be solved for the task, okay? And then you need to understand uh, the capability of both the RL and the control. Okay, so for example, we think that the RL is good as the very complicated, very complicated trade-off uh, in very complicated situations. And the control is good at uh, providing very fast response in relatively simple situations. Okay? And then once you understand your task and un understand your tools, and then you can let the RL and the control work on the paths which are most uh, suitable for them, okay? And then you can accomplish your task uh, normal, uh, with uh, the required uh, requirements without uh, uh, too much uh, difficulty, okay? So this is uh, the high-level uh, philosophy, okay? And uh, to make uh, concrete examples, so I'm going to discuss uh, our solution uh, with two examples, okay? The first example is, uh, is uh, this example. Uh, so it is the autonomous navigation in the dense crowds. So I have a very dense crowd, okay? This is our uh, scenario. I have a robot which is uh, located inside uh, this crowd. And the, the task is that the robots need to smoothly uh, move in this crowd and arrive at one point, which is, uh, uh, for example, given there, and uh, move from this position to another position, okay? <laughs> and uh, the second example is uh, the deformable uh, object manipulation, okay? Basically, is I have some 
objects which is soft, okay? But I need to accurately change the shape or configuration of this object so that it can reach at some uh, desired uh, configuration which is given to you, okay? So there are many applications uh, in reality. So this is uh, two examples. Uh, I will spend uh, uh, much time on the first one, and then I will briefly discuss the second one. Okay, so this is uh, my examples. Okay, so let's go to the first example. The first example is about how to enable robots to navigate in a dense crowd. Okay, so first of all, let me uh, discuss its applications. So it is very useful in the in, in real world because, uh, so for example, it is uh, it can be used for the low speed autonomous driving, and then you can uh, have many applications. Okay, and it can be used as the service robots, so the robot can walk in the mall or in the house, so that it can help people or like interact with people. So this is uh, the main application. And uh, in reality, so there are many people working on this part, okay? And uh, as you can see, the state of the art actually is that uh, the robot can indeed move in the environment with moving obstacles. However, uh, the density or the number of the moving obstacles is uh, very limited, okay? So there are many open spaces around that, and the robots uh, can move around that. So this is uh, the state of the art. What we want to do is that the, the, the density is very high but the robot can still move freely inside of the dense crowd, okay? So let's see how can we, we solve that. So if we use the black box uh, principle, then here is uh, the common solution, which is widely used in industry, okay? So what they're doing is that, so we're going to base on the well-known solution to the autonomous driving, okay? Which is the SLAM uh, like uh, framework. In particular, so we can first ask the robots to build a map and then to localize itself inside that environment. And then we can do the motion planning. So i.e. given the map, the robot can compute a trajectory so that it can avoid all the obstacles and arrive at a goal. And finally, so given the trajectory, the robot can use some feedback control to enable that, to, to enable itself to follow the collision free trajectory. Then eventually the robot can arrive at uh, the, the goal. But this framework only works if there's no moving obstacle inside the environment, okay? So then how can we enable the, or extend the SLAM framework to handle uh, the moving obstacles? So then you can add uh, different parts. So for example, uh, so there are people in the environment, so we can use vision or learning to analyze the crowd, for example, to recognize the people, and then to estimate the motion of the people, and then to track the people, and eventually, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can know, so where is the position or where is the future now, uh, trajectory now for all the surrounding uh, moving obstacles, okay? And after that, uh, we can add the avoid, uh, collision avoidance component to allow the robots to adaptively avoid uh, all the moving, moving objects. So for example, we can use MPC or other techniques to do that, okay? So the collision avoidance uh, we are add some knowledge into the motion planning, and the motion planning to enable the motion planning to consider the moving obstacles, okay? And then finally, we again can ask the control to follow the trajectory. And then in practice, uh, in practice, people usually find that this trajectory is uh, not good, okay? So people will add many, many rules to handle the corner cases, for example, use many if-else or switch to deal with that. So this is uh, uh, the general framework for the industry to uh, solve uh, the, the collision avoidance problem in the in dense crowd. Okay. So if you do that, uh, and also we work with many companies, so these companies uh, actually they implement this kind of system, and then they, they want to uh, see how it works. Okay. The actual performance actually is that the robots were easily getting stuck inside of the dense crowd. The reason actually is, uh, is, is very simple, okay. Because we have many components, and each component uh, is not perfect, okay? So that you need to leave some margin uh, so that the, the, the system can work well. However, if you, collect, if you connect all these components together, these margins will become uh, larger and larger and larger. So eventually, so when the robots make decisions, he will find that, okay? So in each direction, uh, so all the like, margin is uh, blocked, so he has no solution 
but then they stay in place. So in this way, uh, the explosion of the uncertainty or noises uh, will block uh, all the possible moves of the robots. So then the robots will get stuck in place. Okay. So from here, we can see some limitations of the such kind of black box uh, like a principle. Okay, so first of all, so if you are using the black box principle, even though uh, you uh, solve each of the components uh, perfectly, for example, you, you, you make sure that the learning accuracy is very high, you, you make sure that the control accuracy is very high. However, if you connect them together, uh, the, the quality is, uh, is not... Uh, uh, is not good enough. Okay, so this is uh, one limitation of the divine and conquer or, or the black box. The second is that, so if you divide the system into many components, the, the learning components or control components, so then each component may, may be solving some uh, difficult problem than the original task itself. Okay, so here is uh, one example. So for example, so here we are, for example, if we are, uh, uh, if we, we are using our mentioned uh, uh, pipeline to solve the navigation in dense crowd problem. As you can see, I first need to construct a map, then I need to plan a trajectory in the map, and finally I need to avoid the collision uh, with all the moving objects. However, let's look. So for the first task and for the second task, okay, if I'm going to construct a map, I need a very accurate localization and a map so that I can finish uh, the, the planning, uh, that is the planning trajectory in the map, okay? So for, in order to solve the second task, I need a very high accuracy for the first task. So accurate localization and map. So this one requires global knowledge about the scenario, which is uh, very difficult to accomplish in the reality. So this makes the entire problem very, very difficult because the slam is a very difficult problem, okay? So a better solution actually is uh, can we directly solve the navigation in dense crowd problem? Okay. So how can we do that? So as we will show as we will show later. So we will first solve the collision avo avoidance problem. So this is a very local behavior. You you have you don't need that, you don't need to have the localization or map information. So this is a very very simple. Okay. And then you can solve the moving to go uh, task. So this is also relatively simple because you only need a rough uh, localization or even no localization if your environment is, uh, is simple, okay? So then, uh, if we solve the collision avoidance and the moving to, to, the, to the goal, so then we can solve the, the, the original task much better than the pipeline we just showed, okay? Okay, so this is the, the second limitation. The third limitation is that uh, if we consider, if we divide the system into many different components, we may ignore the interaction between different components, okay? So here is another example, okay? So suppose that we want to solve the tracking in the dense crawler problem. So there are many uh, works in the division to solve this, uh, this challenge, okay? The main difficulty is that in the tracking in dense crowd, you have many occlusions, so that you need to do the re-identification you know, to uh, maintain uh, your tracking. Uh, and this is uh, very, very difficult. However, if we have a perfect clean avoidance in dense crowd, then actually this is a relatively simpler problem because uh, we can always track the people with fewer occlusion or reality troubles, and then we can uh, maintain the high quality tracking. Okay? And another Another difficulty in the dense crowd is that uh, how to maintain very high quality localization. Okay, this is uh, very difficult because uh, you may, uh, the, the features may be occluded so that you may lost the localization or the closed loop features. However, if you have a perfect or high quality dense crowd collision avoidance, this is also a relatively simple problem because you can always recover the lost features by actively exploring environments using the collision avoidance. So we will give examples about uh, how to uh, perform the localization in dense crowds uh, in our uh, slides later. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the third limitations for the divider conquer issues. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. So this is, uh, I actually repeat what I mentioned before. So for example, if you are going to use the end-to-end -end IL to solve uh, 
uh, the navigation in dense cloud. This is a very, very, uh, this is a very, very difficult. Okay, you have uh, many limitations. Okay, so let's see. So uh, we just mentioned that we need to uh, rethink our problem deeper. Okay, let's see. So our uh, idea is like that. So let's first think what is the core capability which is required in the navigation in dense clouds. Okay, what is what is the core capability which is uh, very very simple, but it is a must. Uh, you must do very well so that to accomplish a high quality navigation in the dense cloud. So it is difficult to see that uh, by itself. So we can get some idea from the human. Okay, let's first look at uh, some 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 videos. Okay, uh, so for example, this is uh, like autonomous driving uh, like example. Okay, so humans uh, work very well in these scenarios. There is no guidance, there is no control, and the people just uh, use its sensors. Uh, to get information about the surrounding world, and then uh, uh, these kind of cars can uh, collaborate very well inside of these complicated scenarios. So as you can see, uh, in this, as, at least in this example, the core skills for human to do well in this task actually is uh, uh, the very high quality cooperative uh, collision avoidance. Okay, the people can uh, make sure that his car can avoid the collisions with all the surrounding cars, and then if you can. If everyone, if everyone can do this task very well, then the task is done. Okay, and then we can also see uh, uh, this example. Okay, the human is walking inside a dense crowd. So again, as you can see, the human, for example, this uh, blue girl. Okay, uh, she wants to uh, go in the opposite direction of the entire flow. However, as you can see, because she can avoid uh, all the surrounding people good enough, then she can indeed uh, accomplish this task. So we think that, okay, the flexible uh, collision avoidance in dense crowds is the core of this problem. So if we can solve this one good enough, then we can solve all the challenges uh, in the dense cloud navigation, including the localization, mapping, uh, behavior cooperation, planning, and so on and so forth. Okay. So in this talk, I will give you several examples, including the localization, mapping, and the behavior cooperation. Okay. So let's first uh, solve the, the core task, so i.e. how to solve the collision avoidance inside a dense crowd. Okay. So once the core task is uh, determined, then everything becomes much simpler, as you will see. Okay. So first, uh, we, want, we want the robot to behave like a human. Okay. So how, what a human is doing is that uh, it can uh, have some knowledge about the relative position, about the surrounding agents. And also know their relative velocity. Okay, and uh, given this information, the robots uh, will determine what is uh, its uh, steering decisions, like for example, velocity and directions. Okay, uh, and also we want to avoid all the difficulties about the vision or like the other things or, or learning. So we want to avoid uh, the traditional difficulties like the recognition or position or velocity estimation. So we want to use the raw and the data. Okay, so once this is uh, decided, uh, then uh, our pipeline is that okay. So I have some controller, and uh, this controller it can uh, get the sense measurement about the surrounding world. So we are using lidar here. Okay, for example, so the lidar is uh, is like that. So basically, is the robot we are uh, like uh, use the lidar to uh, to measure whether there are obstacles around it. Okay, and uh, so then the raw data will, will be served into a neural network, and uh, the, this neural network will generate uh, the steering command uh, in order to, uh, to move the robot. Okay, so this is uh, the controller. So then, uh, how can we compute uh, this controller, or how can we find this controller? So one way is that we can use the traditional control principles. Okay, so i.e., we start from physics. What is the first principle to make sure that uh, the two robots uh, will not avoid each other. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, this first principle is called the velocity obstacle. So here I briefly uh, like introduce uh, the background. So I have two robots. The two robots have uh, uh, different uh, velocities. Okay, and then I can consider uh, one of the robot A, for example, is a point. So then the robot B need to be expanded. So this is uh, that it can be a larger sphere. Okay, and then I can compute the relative uh, relative relative velocity between the A and the B, 
Okay? And uh, some first principle from physics uh, can tell you that if this relative velocity will not enter this grid region, then it can, you can guarantee that the, the two, ob two robots will not collide with each other in a limited time. Okay? This is uh, what we can get from the first principle. So intuitively, this first principle control tells you that any velocity that can result in the future collision in a limited time should be discarded. Okay? This is uh, what, we, what, we can, what we can guarantee about this controller. However, in order to use this controller, you need to tune many parameters, so it is difficult to use in practice. Okay? And after some experience, we think that the learning is uh, more appropriate. Why? There are several reasons. The first is that the learning allows you to use the rich sensor data. And also, you can make a very complicated uh, trade-off between the safety and the efficiency. So this is uh, very important uh, for navigation. Okay? And also, learning helps you to optimize the parameters. So you don't, you don't need to tune the parameters for the controller. Uh, and also, uh, learning algorithms allows you to use rough localization. So as you, can, as you will see later, the requirement for rough localization is uh, very, limit, uh, very important. Okay? It is uh, very important uh, for many applications. And the rough localization is sufficient for learning. However, it is not sufficient for control. And then, if you can implement or optimize the controller uh, good enough, then you can accomplish such kind of behavior. Okay? So as, you, as you can see, uh, this, so the, each point is a robot. Okay? And as you can see, the robot can have a sensor to uh, like, uh, get the range information about the surrounding world. And also, notice that we can also use uh, 100 deg 180 degree uh, sensors rather than uh, 330 degrees. Okay, you can use a sensor which has a limited uh, uh, range angles. And then, if everyone is uh, using the same controller, eventually they can cooperate very well uh, in, the, in the scenario. Okay? So this is uh, what we are doing. Okay, so then how can you uh, use uh, learning to get this controller? So we are just uh, use uh, the reinforced learning. Okay? Uh, this is the controller framework pipeline. So you, can, you are using the uh, the, the, the LiDAR data, and also you are using the, like, uh, for example, you know the velocity of yourself, because also you ha have the IMU sensors, and uh, uh, you have uh, some global GPS to tell you what the, lo the location of yourself, so you have the, the, the goal uh, positions, okay? And finally, the output of the controller is the steering command, okay? And then you can use IR to optimize the entire crowd, okay, rather than the only one agent. You optimize the, the behavior for the entire crowd to minimize the, the collision cost, also to minimize the time to reach all the goals, and also to maximize the smooth, smoothness for the trajectory. Okay? If you optimize all of them, then eventually you will encourage uh, the, the, the smooth cooperation between different agents. Okay? So you will see the examples uh, from my later slides. Okay, so then let's see how to train that. So we are training the, the controller using two steps. In the first step, uh, because IR is difficult to, uh, to start from scratch, so we let IR to just uh, first learn some baby controller, which are trained on some simple scenarios. Okay? So as you can see, uh, uh, the simple scenarios only include uh, some random configurations. There is no obstacle in that. Okay? Only a few, only a few uh, agents. And after the training, as you can see, uh, the robots can have some cooperation between them. And after that, uh, we start from this baby controller and to improve that uh, more. Uh, basically, is that we will train all the controllers on multiple challenging scenarios. So as you can see here, uh, these scenarios have some, ob uh, some like static obstacles, and some of them have very narrow uh, like, uh, packages. Okay? The robot is difficult uh, to go through, and also there are many more agents inside of these scenarios. Okay, and after uh, the training, so we want to make sure that all the agents can work well in all scenarios. Okay, so this is uh, what happens after the training is finished. Okay, so as you can see, we only train in a relatively simple scenarios with only a few obstacles. Okay, 
Okay, so this is uh, what happens after the training is finished, and then we see whether our controller really can learn the skills to avoid the collisions. Okay, so now I have 100 robots. Actually, we can do 1,000 robots. Okay, so that's not difficult at all. And uh, so the robot will start uh, at the boundary of the circle, and it will move toward the, uh, the opposite position on circles. Okay. Because each robot have only a limited range about the surrounding world. So as you can see, they basically they, they were difficult, uh, they definitely they were, they were like uh, have uh, congestions inside uh, the, the middle. However, because uh, they can, they have very good skills to avoid collisions, so they can uh, release these uh, congestions good enough. Okay, so this is uh, what happened. And also the, our, uh, our method can also allow the uh, allow the robots to, uh, for example, to navigate uh, in some, some environments with some obstacles, but we don't know where the obstacle is, okay? And as you can see, uh, indeed, uh, so uh, the second one is our algorithms. As you can see, they can leverage uh, the narrow packages much better than the traditional control-based algorithms. Okay, and then uh, in the next step, actually we want to deploy our algorithm to the real world, okay? To the real robot. Uh, However, we found that uh, there are some difficulties. And uh, in that procedure, we found that pure learning actually is not enough, okay? You cannot learn everything. Uh, the learning is uh, very good uh, to make trade-offs. However, it is uh, very difficult to respond in time or to generate some optimal uh, behaviors. So that we want to combine the learning with some low-level control in order to further improve the behavior, okay? Uh, so, for example, so in some red, in some very very simple uh, cases, then you need to use the optimal control to uh, to solve that uh, directly. So, in some very uh, dangerous cases, then you need to uh, use some rule-based control to make sure that everything is okay. Okay, so this is our idea, and uh, so then uh, what we propose is a hybrid control uh, framework. In particular, we will have some way to analyze the uh, different scenarios to see uh, whether it is uh, good, uh, dangerous, safe, or just uh, very complicated. So for example, the green one means that, okay, uh, the, the, it is some open space, so it is uh, relatively simple. And the blue one means that, okay, so uh, there are uh, some obstacles around that, so it is uh, very complicated. And the, the red one means that there is uh, some obstacle which is uh, very close to me, which means that it is uh, very dangerous, okay? And for different uh, scenarios, I will diff we will decide different controllers, and then we can switch between different controllers, okay? And then the learning algorithms can help to learn when to switch and uh, what is uh, the criteria for different scenarios, okay? So then learning can indeed uh, be used uh, to optimize uh, the hybrid control. Okay, so after we are using the hybrid control, then we indeed found that many problems which is uh, uh, available inside the, which exists in the uh, in the in the learning based control has uh, disappeared. So, for example, uh, uh, the left side is the pure learning, and the right side is the hybrid uh, control method. Okay. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, in, in the blue uh, in, in the left one, you have some very large curvature, and uh, however, in the in the right one, uh, so the, the curvature is much smaller. Okay. And uh, let's see. Uh, I have some example here to show this kind of meta level behaviors. Okay, uh, so, so this is just uh, the, the original example, okay, so the, the kind of like a sphere example. So as you can see, when the agents are very close to the center, uh, so here are the uh, areas the congestion is, uh, is most, and then it is uh, very dangerous, so you need to, uh, to, to uh, choose a very conservative policy, okay? So when the agent is uh, very close to the outside, then it is uh, relatively safer, okay? So then it needs to use the PID control or optimal control to, to uh, go for efficiency. And uh, between the center and the boundary, then the, the robot needs to make a trade-off. Okay, so then most of them is, is blue. Okay, this is uh, what we get. And then this is our uh, simulations in, in the in simulation. Okay, so there are like 100 robots with the random initial positions and the random goal positions. So as you can see, you can also see the, the global behavior is, is correct. Okay, so in the middle uh, is almost uh, like uh, like red, 
and then in the boundary, it is mostly uh, green, and uh, uh, between them, it is blue. Okay. However, because there's some randomness there, so the, uh, the, the color is also randomized. But you can see uh, how things uh, are switched between uh, uh, places to places. Okay. And uh, we found that the hybrid control uh, indeed help when the density is uh, very, very high. Okay. So as you can see that uh, when the density increases, uh, the behavior of the reinfor reinforced learning actually is uh, uh, like degrees a lot. However, the hybrid control can still like uh, slowly, uh, the, the performance will slowly uh, decrease. Okay. And uh, so this one actually is very important for us to make our uh, real robot examples. So here is uh, uh, what we did uh, for the real robot. Okay. So we are using the UWB for the rough uh, localization. And uh, the robot uh, has no knowledge about map, so, you, so that, so that uh, the robot does not know that there are some boxes inside scenarios. Just to use its sensors to uh, observe that. Okay. And, uh, and the main advantage, as you will see, is that because we don't need to have map, so we can add persons inside uh, these scenarios. Okay. So then it can, the, the, the persons can work together with the robot. Uh, but still, everything is, is safe. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this is our our, our examples in the world, and also we are doing something. For example, to uh, enable this one to work uh, in the in the three D. For example, in the in the drone. Okay. So uh, so this is on simulation. So we are working on the real robot now, but it is much difficult, uh, much more difficult. So, uh, so this is in simulation, so we can do that, okay? Okay, uh, so after this part, what we have done is that uh, we have enabled the robot to learn uh, very high quality collision avoidance capability, okay? Uh, so that they can avoid the collisions uh, with all the obstacles in a very flexible way, okay? And also we can cooperate uh, with, with other obstacles in a clever way, okay? Because uh, because we train the multi agent, so we have we can inject some cooperation inside its, its behavior. Okay, so after that, let's solve the like navigation and dense crawl problem. Okay, um, so let's first see a very very simple like implementation. Okay, so we just uh, the robot just to use our original algorithms, which is uh, trained in simulation, and also it's uh, consider humans as just a very dumb. Uh, moving objects. Okay, let's see how the robot will behave. And uh, so in this our examples, uh, uh, the human will have some UWB in his hand, and the robots uh, will try to follow the signals of the UWB. Okay, let's see. So this is uh, uh, what we have. Uh, so as you can see, that this, this robot will try to follow this uh, uh, student uh, before him. Actually, the, this uh, the one with the black uh, black teachers. Okay, yeah. It will move, okay, and everything is smooth, okay. It can avoid that the static obstacles, as you can see, and also avoid that uh, the moving obstacles, okay. So this is the one evidence, like uh, he, uh, this robot does not have any knowledge of a map, okay. Okay, this is this is the most interesting place. Like it's very, very dense, okay? But it still can reactively avoid uh, all the obstacles. Okay, so this is a very, very simple uh, experiment. Okay, so just to use uh, everything trained in simulation and then uh, use that uh, in the real world. Okay, so we don't uh, analyze uh, the, the behavior of the human. We don't predict the, 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 the trajectory of human. And uh, we do nothing, okay? Just to uh, use what we just trained. Okay, and uh, apparently you can see the mutation, okay, because uh, the robot does not consider the human's preference, so the robot actually is overly responsible for the collision avoidance, okay, as you can see, it will, like, uh, change its orientation uh, quickly, you know, to avoid uh, the, 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 uh, the collision with uh, the, the surrounding people, okay. So later in the slides, we will show some of our, like, new work about how to uh, inject the human preference inside uh, this uh, task. Okay, but this one actually is a very, very like useful like tools. So many companies are using that now. Okay, uh, so you can log, it, it's, it is difficult to imagine how so such kind of simple algorithms 
in your work in many situations. Okay, so this is the outdoor environment. So again, use a lighter. Okay. Uh, so this one, of course, is uh, relatively simple, and then there are humans now. Okay, and uh, it can uh, at least it can uh, work well in this outdoor environment. <laughs> okay, and uh, our algorithm actually can uh, be easily extended uh, to other kind of robots. Okay, so this is uh, one robot uh, uh, implemented by, by CMU. Okay, so we just pause that, and then uh, we just show that in the exhibition, and uh, it will run well for three hours. Okay, three hours without any stop. And as you can see, you know, so the, a few people have like the surround this robot. So the robot can go around and see from a policy so that they can uh, leave this round. Okay, and uh, actually we also like very simple like uh, we extend that to a lab robot. Okay, it's a dog, and based on that we are doing some like future work. Okay, so as you can see, this is a dog, and uh, the, the, and also it can uh, avoid the collisions with the, like the environment uh, very well. Okay, including the moving obstacles and uh, the, the the static obstacles. Okay, so whenever the leg appears between the uh, the, the, the the leg, uh, the dog, uh, the dog will, will stop. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. And then, uh, in, so we have, uh, so we don't do much, but we uh, use the clear rodents to solve the, the navigation in the dense cloud. Okay. So next, I'm going to show a few examples of how to use this core task to solve other uh, like important uh, challenges uh, in the robotics. For example, localization in clouds, mapping clouds, and the behavior cooperation. Okay. So first, let's look at uh, localization. So traditional localization has many uh, challenges, but in dense clouds, it is uh, much more difficult because uh, the, 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 the people or pedestrians now will occlude uh, a lot of features which are important now for localization. So then if you just use the traditional localization algorithms, it will feel like very frequently. So how can we do? So there are many ways to do that. So theoretically, we can do uh, the, the information gather. Okay, so this is uh, the very uh, like classic solution in the robotics. The basic idea is that okay, so I don't know where I'm, where I am, so that I need to move to some regions with uh, rich localizing features, so that I can gather uh, sufficient uh, information, and then we can recover the localization, and eventually we can continue. Okay, so how can we do? So here is uh, one example. Okay, so suppose that. Uh, the, the, the black one is uh, the place without uh, any information, and the real place are the uh, places uh, with a uh, sufficient feature so that you can recover your your like uh, uh, your localization. So the simplest way is that you can directly go uh, toward the goal. But as you can see, because I have no localization, so there are many noises. So eventually, uh, my arrow around the goal is very large. So then the most appropriate way is that I can first move toward uh, the place with uh, sufficient features. And then I can, I can recover uh, my localization there, and if then I can go towards uh, the goal. Okay? So in this way, I can minimize uh, my, uh, my errors in, in the goal. Okay? So this is a very decent uh, like framework. However, there are many issues. Basically, is that you need to solve the chicken and the egg difficulty. Okay? Because uh, in order to execute the information gain policy, you need to move in the dense cloud. So this is uh, very difficult. Okay. So this is why uh, this kind of chicken egg problem is uh, is never solved before. Okay. So basically, is uh, you need to you have lost your location so that you can you cannot navigate uh, good enough. Because you cannot navigate good enough, then you cannot recover your localization. So you have this kind of like uh, uh, like circle here. So our solution is that. You actually can uh, use our, our algorithms to, to, to implement the, the recover, uh, the localization recover policy. The reason is that our collision avoidance does not depend on the localization accuracy. Okay? So our moving to go also can safely use a very rough localization based on, for example, based on MU or based on the global GPS. Okay? So this is, uh, so you don't have too much requirements for the localization accuracy, so that you can use our policy to uh, accomplish the, 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 the recover policy. Okay. So in this way, we can solve the chicken and egg problem. Okay. 
Let's see what we're doing. What we're doing actually is uh, very simple. We're going to choose one region in the map as a temporary goal for observing the features and to recover the localization. Okay? Actually, we need to uh, choose off between different uh, criteria uh, to determine which region to choose. For example, the distance to the robots, uh, the, the richness of the features, uh, and also you know, how difficult it is for robots to pass through the crowd flow and to reach the region. Okay, the third one is uh, the most uh, important uh, in our case because, so here is one example. So as you can see, the human is uh, moving in this direction, okay? And the robot wants to recover its separation. It has two choices, uh, the blue one and the yellow one, okay? The blue one is uh, closer to the robot. However, in order to arrive, in, uh, in order to arrive with this uh, blue one, you need to go through uh, a very dense crowd of flow. It is very, very difficult, okay? So for the efficiency, you prefer to go to the yellow one to recover your, your localization. Okay, so how to determine this one? Okay, so actually, we found that uh, the reinforced learning actually can help you to do that. So the value function inside the RL you trained actually provides sufficient knowledge uh, about that. So just uh, you can use that. You can use the value function in the RL algorithms as a criteria about, uh, to, to determine uh, your, 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 your like, uh, recovered regions. Okay. This part, I just uh, ignore details. Okay. Uh, so in this way, because the value function will change from time to time, okay, so then you can adaptively update your policy according to the crowd flow uh, status. So here is uh, uh, one illustration about what's happening. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, so the robot is moving toward the goal. Okay. So in the beginning, everything is okay. And uh, the slam will give you the traditional localization is, uh, is working. However, at some moment, suddenly, the slam fails. Okay. So then you need to recover. Okay. So then, what we are going to do is that I'm going to use the value function to select from the green points. Okay. So the different colors indicate uh, different uh, uh, values or qualities for the, for the feature richness. And then it can uh, choose some of the uh, features to recover its localization, okay? So w I will have some like videos later in the, in the, in the real robot. So first, let's, let's look at some, uh, some simulation benchmarks, okay? In order to uh, quantitative, quantitatively compare, compare different algorithms. Okay, so we compare algorithms in three simulation environments, okay? And then we compare our algorithms with different uh, uh, recover policies and also policies without uh, recover consideration. And then we'll see that uh, in all the situations, okay, and our, our success rate is much higher than before, okay, it can, so that the robot can uh, work much better in, the, in this environment. And uh, the performance on the different density is also the same, okay, so our method is uh, much better uh, than the previous algorithms. Okay, so let's look at uh, this, uh, this uh, real world uh, examples, okay. The robot is going, uh, forward, okay, so everything is okay here, and then suddenly, at this moment, uh, the localization fails, okay, so then the robot will try to search, okay, so here is a, there's a corner in the left, so then the robot will move to the corner, and then to recover uh, its, uh, its localization, and then it can continue, and then go through its, uh, its goal, okay, so this is, this is uh, what's happening in, in the real world. Uh, okay. So we have uh, discussed that briefly about the localization uh, problems, and then we are going to uh, use our uh, method to solve the mapping and the behavior uh, cooperation in a dense crowd. Okay, so this is uh, our recent work. So this is uh, much more interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, so first of all, let's, let's think about, okay, how can you enable a robot to uh, do the mapping, to know where it is inside uh, the dense crowd? Okay, it is very, very difficult because the traditional mapping algorithms relies on the matching features of the same static object at different uh, time points, okay? However, if you have moving obstacles in scenario, then you can see there are two difficulties. The first is that uh, the moving obstacles may occlude uh, the features on the static obstacles. Second, uh, the features on the moving obstacles may confuse the robot. Okay, they may, the robot may confuse the features of the moving obstacles for the features of some of the static obstacles they, uh, it, observed, it observed before. Okay, so then the every, 
if you have these two problems, then the entire slum algorithms will fail. Okay. So then how are the common solutions to this difficulty? The common solution is that uh, the moving obstacle is not good. So what we are going to do is that we can detect the moving obstacles, okay, for, for example, using vision or some other learning algorithms, and then we can remove these uh, moving obstacles from the same element, okay, only leave the static uh, obstacle features, and then we can do the correct slam, okay? However, uh, such, kind of, uh, such kind of detection is very difficult to be robust, okay? So our idea actually is the opposite, okay? Rather than considering the moving pedestrians as troubles for the mapping, uh, we will consider them as a useful information source uh, for mapping. So they are very, very useful for mapping, as we will see. So how is it possible? Let's see. The intuition is, uh, is, uh, is very simple. Okay, so let's look at this video. Okay. So from this video, we can see that uh, the cloud that the field actually indicates the position of the static, static obstacles. Okay. So here, given a video, I can, uh, we can reconstruct uh, the vector field uh, for the entire scenario. As you can see, uh, for example, uh, in the middle, right here, okay, so this, uh, the human is just moving forward, which means that this is a road. And then, as you can see, uh, this vector field has some boundary, which will indicate that this is the boundary for the places uh, that the human would prefer not to walk on. Okay, so this is some, some boundary for the, or so, 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 some obstacles uh, in, the, in the scenarios. And then, uh, given this field, then actually we can enable the robot to, to navigate. So our task actually is uh, how can we uh, reconstruct this uh, that field uh, using the mapping techniques, okay? And if we can get this data field, actually we can do much more, okay? In particular, the information, uh, this data field uh, also encode uh, some information about the social preference about uh, the moving directions. Because uh, uh, the, the place that the vector field uh, the, the is, uh, is dense mean, means that human prefer to move in that direction. Okay. So the next uh, question is that how can we use mapping to reconstruct uh, this uh, this map? Okay. So it is possible. The only difference is that we are using the uh, we are using uh, the we only change the sense measurement. Okay. So we will consider the human flow as the sense measurement, and then we can do that. So here is, uh, here is uh, uh, some illustration. So as you can see, uh, the, the robot is, uh, is staying there, and then the, the human is moving around, then the human can uh, observe uh, the movement of the pedestrian, and then it can get the back fields uh, around the, uh, that region, okay? And then uh, we can integrate the everything uh, into the, the mapping, uh, map, mapping framework. So as you can see, uh, the robot can move around, okay, and uh, it can eventually uh, reconstruct uh, the 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 vector field, okay. So in this in this like procedure, uh, the robot uh, does not use any information about uh, the static environment, okay. So this is only possible if the robot can navigation uh, freely inside uh, a dense crowd. Otherwise, uh, the robot will get stuck and it cannot uh, perform this kind of exploration, okay. Okay, so after that, so we can get one map, okay? From this map, actually, you can see that uh, it can provide uh, sufficient information about the navigation preference. For example, there is a loop here, and people uh, prefer to navigate in this, uh, like, uh, uh, I think it's the anti, uh, it's the uh, end clockwise uh, directions, okay? And also, there are four entries uh, to this scenario, okay? And after that, we can use uh, search algorithms to plan uh, the trajectory for the robot, and then can we use our IR-based collision avoidance to do some local adjustment, okay? Then, then we can enable the robot to navigate in this scenario. Uh, so here is uh, uh, one example uh, in simulation, okay? So as you can see, I have such kind of scenarios, and uh, if I only use the map, which is uh, reconstructed uh, using, for example, using like uh, traditional algorithms, so and, uh, you are using the shortest path, to plan the trajectory. So as you can see, for the robots to move from that position to that go position, it will choose uh, to use uh, the, the right path. However, if you consider the flow map, then the robot will choose uh, to navigate uh, in the other side. Okay, this is uh, what's happening. Okay, let's see. 
the robot will first plan a trajectory, okay? And then it will navigate the, through this trajectory. So we are using the D star algorithms so that uh, when the map changes in time, so then the robots now will also now adjust its trajectory like in time, okay? So as you can see, the robots will, uh, will navigate uh, along this trajectory. And then if it observes different uh, flows, then it will also now uh, you can control or reinforce learning to change its trajectory. <laughs> okay. So in this way, you can see that uh, the robot will prefer uh, to follow human's flow to minimize the disturbance uh, to the human flow so that you can ma maximize uh, the efficiency of the entire crowd. And then we can overcome the overly responsible problem so that the humans will like match the, the, the behavior of the humans rather than like uh, go toward them. Okay, so this is uh, the main uh, advantage of uh, this, this method. And finally, uh, one very natural question is that, so we have the mapping, okay? And then can we use, uh, can we do sort of the, the slam? Okay, basically is can we do the mapping and the localization simultaneously? So i.e., we need to replace the slime algorithms uh, using the static, uh, using the moving, moving objects rather than use the, the static objects. The answer is yes. Okay, just uh, you can use the crowd field as features to obtain very rough localization. Okay, so here is, uh, is some example by putting everything together. Okay, and uh, so here we are using the particle filter uh, for the localization. Okay, so as you can see, uh, uh, the robot is doing the localization. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so the, the red points is, uh, the red, red trajectory is the localization using the features of the static obstacles. And the green one actually is uh, uh, the, the mean, mean of the, the particles, which is, uh, uh, no, so the yellow one is the mean of the particles, which is uh, uh, the localization results by using the cross feature. And the green one is the ground truth, okay? So as you can see, because there are many occlusions inside the, the, the human crowd, so as you can see, the red one it is uh, much worse than the, than the yellow one, okay? And the yellow one actually it can, uh, it can match well with uh, the ground truth. So it is uh, not exact same as the ground truth because, uh, the, 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 because the, the crowd feature is uh, quite sparse and uh, it is not very stable. But as you can see, it's, uh, it is much better than the, than the red one, okay? But this is uh, uh, the, the global behavior. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, then I can make a summary about the first part, okay? Uh, to, so in the first part, we provide uh, one example about how to combine the control and the learning, okay? Uh, so we start with uh, the creation avoidance as the core task, and then we solve that using the reinforced learning, okay? It's the learning part. And then we can see that for other parts, we can only use the control or traditional robotics techniques, so we can, we can do that. And then we can get uh, much better results uh, than the state of that. Uh, okay. And uh, so then we, we, le we let the learning focus on the trade-off in the creation avoidance and uh, use the traditional control and the robotic techniques to handle the other parts. Okay. And uh, as we can see, we solve some challenges uh, in the robotics, including the localization, uh, mapping, and the SLAM, and also uh, the human friendly, human friendly navigation. Okay. So this is uh, the first part and the first examples. Okay, uh, I have only a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes, I guess. Uh, I can make a very fast introduction about the second part, okay? About how to uh, combine the learning and control to solve the deformable object manipulation. Okay, so uh, for this part, uh, our goal actually is uh, actually very low, okay? Uh, so the motivation is uh, uh, coming from industry. Uh, so this is what we observed before in some shoe factory in Anta, okay, which is a very large like a sports company in China. And uh, so what they are doing is that they want to uh, make shoes, okay, actually the insole fabrication. Uh, the insole fabrication, if, if you go to factory, it is uh, done in two steps, okay. The first step is in the left, okay. It is called the closed assembly. So there are some uh, fixtures, some pins, okay. Uh, this worker actually is uh, put the closes now. Uh, uh, the, the clothes has some holes, so that the, 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 this work is uh, put these clothes uh, onto these uh, fixtures to uh, stabilize uh, these uh, clothes, okay? This is called the clothes piece assembly. And after that, 
So everything is uh, automated, automated, okay? So as you can see, some sewing machine can do the sewing like uh, uh, automatically, okay? And uh, okay, so our goal is that okay, can we replace this human worker and by some robots? Okay, so this is our goal. Very very simple. Uh, so actually, this is uh, uh, have some even more useful applications. Okay, so for example, the bra and the suturing. So this is actually we have some uh, ongoing projects. Okay, uh, basically, is, uh, so as in the left, as you can see, this is a human worker. Okay, it is uh, suturing some some bra. Okay, because bra has some, uh, it is a uh, uh, actually it's a very com it's a relatively complicated. Okay, it has two materials. These two materials uh, are combined together, and eventually it will make a two point five D shape. Okay, it is not a, uh, like a plain plain shape. So then, uh, what we're doing is that can we enable robots to automatically accomplish this task. Okay, let's see. It's possible. Okay. So, uh, so <laughs> then as you can see, if you design the trajectory good enough, okay, eventually you can uh, accomplish this uh, like the 2.5D assembly. Okay, this is uh, the final result. <laughs> okay, so uh, in this talk, I'm going to only discuss the simpler version of our, our problem. Okay, so we simplify this problem and uh, into the, this this two parts basically is how can we uh, ha we have some pins on the on table okay and uh, the clothes have uh, a few holes on that and our goal is that can we insert these holes onto the pin so this is our our, our task and uh, so if we finish that then that's it okay, okay. so this is uh, even it is simplified however it is still a non trivial task okay because the controller need to generalize in different situations the first of all, we don't know the material for these closed pieces. Some of them is soft, some of them is hard, okay? And we don't want to, the, the engineer to, uh, to input the materials uh, for the, mater uh, the material parameters every time. The second is uh, the closed pieces that have different number of holes, okay? Some of them have four holes, and some of them only have two holes, and so on and so forth. Finally, uh, in manufacturing, the, the, the holes that have different tolerance, okay? So you sometimes you need to stretch the, the clothes a bit so that you can put the holes inside another pins. So this is uh, the main challenges, okay? Okay, so then how can you do that? Okay, seems that this is, this is a very complicated task uh, and uh, seems that you need to have some high level policy, okay? So then it seems that uh, the learning algorithms uh, is the more appropriate, okay? Uh, so there are many possible solutions. For example, you can use the reinforcement learning, you can use uh, the imitation learning, or, or the learning from demonstration. Okay, Let, let's see. Okay, uh, so learning from demonstration, we did a lot of work about that before. So for example, this is our previous work, uh, like about the how to uh, how to like uh, tie a knot. Okay, so the human first uh, show how to tie a knot, and then. Uh, the robots uh, can uh, learn by itself okay, how to copy this behavior into some new situations. So it is not uh, the very simple copy, but you need to uh, do some adjustment. Okay. And then uh, you can, uh, uh, so this is, uh, okay, so this is just some demo showing that, okay, you can do different types of uh, no tying. Okay, let me sk skip this video. And then uh, if you combine the learning from demonstration, uh, I, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the deep learning together, actually, uh, uh, you can use uh, the demonstration uh, with the image, video, and the tactile information as a measurement. And then the demonstration will include all of these kind of uh, sensor, sensor information. And then you can use that to do the, to do the, like, uh, the closed manipulation. Okay? So here is uh, the uh, folding. Okay. Uh, this is some very old video. Okay, so let me finish the first step, and then you can. Uh, uh, let, let's skip that. Okay, so everything looks very good. Okay, so the robot can do that. Uh, so why don't we just uh, use that in our task? Uh, however, uh, these kind of learning algorithms uh, actually fails uh, on the assembly task. So there are many reasons. Okay, so for not not tying, it works, and for the like uh, like uh, folding, it works. The reason is that uh, for these tasks, the accuracy uh, actually is uh, very low. Okay, you don't, need a, you don't need to have very high accuracy. What it requires there is that you need to require very flexible, multi-step policy. Okay, uh, but however, in the closed assembly, 
I only have one step, but I need a very high accuracy and also the relatively high flexibility. Okay? And the second thing is that uh, in no time, you can use the simulation in the IL and it works okay, because uh, the not physics is uh, relatively simple. However, uh, in the closed assembly into a model very complicated interaction between the closed, fixture, grip, and also the other environments. Okay? So then uh, it is difficult or relatively difficult now to accomplish a high quality simulation. Okay, so we indeed uh, did something before. Basically is that uh, we try to make sure that the simulation and the real world uh, give the same uh, results. Okay, so this is uh, our results after very, very careful optimization of uh, the hyperparameters uh, for the physics simulator. But as you can see, even though it is uh, already very similar, as you can see, uh, some, some important details are still uh, very different. Okay, so if these details uh, does not affect your controller, that's okay. However, if you are learning algorithms uh, like the randomly like uh, leverage these details, then it will be a disaster. Okay. So in order to avoid all these uh, difficulties, so what we are going to do is that uh, we finally decided to use the traditional control, and in particular the, the, the visual server control. Okay. So the idea is very simple. Okay. The robot observes some images where you go. So for example, the two points are on the closes. Okay. And then you know that now I want to move the, uh, the closing point from A to B. Okay, I have some, some, some error in the image space. And then uh, I, can, uh, I can find the relationship now between the, the error in the image space and the error in the journal space. Okay, I can have the equation delta x equal to j and delta, delta q. So delta x is the image space velocity, uh, delta q is uh, the journal space velocity, and J is uh, the Jacobian. Okay. So uh, for most traditional tasks, the Jacobian can be analytically computed. So it is very simple. Okay. However, for our task, it is uh, relatively a bit more complicated. The reason is that uh, here, uh, the Jacobian is uh, uh, related with the closed dynamics. Okay. So basically, is, uh, when you move the grip a bit, how will the closed point moves? It is uh, related with the closed dynamics. And uh, so this is unknown, okay? This is Jacobian is unknown, and you cannot compute that analytically, and it will change over time, so it is uh, much more complicated, and it also will change uh, when your material changes. So it is also uh, uh, like more complicated. So then what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to use some nonlinear online algorithms, for example, a Gaussian process, or neural network, we can uh, learn these uh, nonlinear Jacobians, and then we can dynamically update the Jacobian uh, during the manipulation to best describe uh, the relationship that between the DLX and the IQ. Okay, and then we, so when we are using the controller, we are going to use uh, this uh, Jacobian uh, for a for a short horizon, and then we can update this uh, Jacobian uh, like after uh, this uh, horizon. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the basic uh, framework. So here we have injected a, a bit uh, like learning into the controller. Okay, uh, the, the details I just skipped. So we have tried uh, the nonlinear uh, Gaussian process controller, and also uh, we can extend that uh, to the general controller using the deep uh, neural network. Okay, let's see some some results. Okay, so this is uh, our original task. Okay, as you can see, I have uh, two holes, and also uh, I have some material which is uh, relatively soft. But the robot doesn't know. Okay, the robot will update uh, uh, this uh, Jacobian uh, in, uh, on time, and eventually it can finish this task. Okay, and then this is another task. So you have a relatively hard, uh, harder uh, like material, and also as you can see, there are four holes uh, on, on, on this uh, on, on this uh, fabric. Okay, as you can see, uh, it can also do the same thing. Okay, so. Uh, the success rate uh, for this uh, this task is very high, almost 100 percent. Okay, we can always uh, finish that. Okay, and also we tried uh, some other uh, like uh, like uh, classical tasks uh, in the deformable object manipulation. Okay, so this is uh, one which is uh, very uh, important in the surgery. Uh, basically, is that how to control the position uh, of one point on the on the 
on the uh, material on, on the soft object. Okay, so we can uh, control that very accurately. And also, this is uh, another another like task. Basically, is how to match uh, the the features of uh, the material. Okay, and uh, we also compare that you, you uh, with the traditional controller. So as you can see, uh, if we measure the behavior using the control criteria, okay, so for example, the overshooting and also the acceleration, as you can see, uh, uh, for in our task, so basically our the real one is our behavior, and as you can see, the overshooting is much smaller, and uh, the acceleration is also uh, much smaller. Okay, so it is uh, much much better than the traditional control, and uh, also you can see that the success rate is also very high. Okay. Uh, even you have the human perturbation, it is still relatively high. And uh, the neural network indeed can further improve the performance. Let me express that. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, uh, my very fast uh, uh, introduction about uh, the deformable object manipulation. And as you can see, uh, in this part, uh, we have shown that the learning is uh, appropriate uh, for modeling the complex interaction between the deformable objects and the environment. However, as you can see, the overall pipeline is still more suitable for the traditional video server feedback controller. Okay? The learning maybe is not very accurate in the, uh, for, 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 for this in the task. And uh, pure reinforcement learning uh, seems does not fit in here. Okay? In, no matter in the convenience or in the efficiency or in the accuracy, it cannot compare. At least at this moment, it cannot compare with uh, our, our combination. Okay. So this is our talk. Uh, this is my talk. Okay. And the conclusion is that, uh, so beside uh, consider control and learning as black boxes and the combine together, so there are some like, higher level way to combine the, the control and learning. Okay. But how to do that good enough? It is always an art. And uh, you need to inspect your problem carefully and also you need to let the control and learning handle the, the tasks most appropriate for themselves. And uh, uh, it is usually important to figure out which is uh, the core subtask and also need to start from there. Okay, so this is uh, my talk. Okay, uh, okay. Thanks, thanks for the attention. Anyway. Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, sure. A uh, crawl feature, uh, what I mean is that it's uh, reconstructed the crawl flow uh, locally around itself. So basically, is that if I observe some like people going here, here, and I can uh, reconstruct some like uh, flow around myself, and then I have a map like which I already like for example constructed, and then I can compare uh, this uh, flow features with uh, the, uh, like uh, different features inside the map, and I can know where I am. Yeah. Uh, we are using the point cloud and the RGB, both both of them. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, for the point cloud, it is difficult to uh, detect the holes uh, robust enough. Uh, because we are using RGBD, so RGBD sensor is uh, very noisy, and uh, we actually we need to rely on the RGB to de detect the holes. However, uh, uh, sometimes uh, I want to uh, we want to recover the, the so for example when part of the clothes is occluded, okay, uh, we want to recover the the the, the occluded parts. Using the, some some like graphics techniques. So for that part, we need to use RGBD. Yeah. I'm also curious about one more thing about the local recovery from localization. Yeah. Uh huh. Error. So you use the value function to find the optimal location for recovery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, if this the localization is already lost, how do you even go to the recovery point? Right. Good, good question. Yes. So so here is that. Uh, so first of all, I, we can we know that where I have lost my localization. Okay, so I have some relatively good enough localization at that moment, and then I still have my IMU. So I can uh, very IMU IMU can give you a relatively rough localization, and then you can start from there. So then eventually, now I still roughly know that okay, the features is uh, in that area, and then I just need to move uh, uh, like uh, toward the area. 
during that the procedure, I can use my cameras or other sensors uh, to detect features and then to uh, verify whether this is indeed uh, the features I want to, to, I want to use. Yeah. So this is a, a complicated uh, like a procedure. Yeah. Basically, the creature avoidance guarantees that you can do that. So uh, if you can go through the crowd uh, successfully, then you can do that. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. For that one, uh, for that one, of course, I, we have a map. So, okay, so just, um, I'm, I need to verify that, okay, clar clarify that. So, for that one, uh, for that task, because uh, the task is that, okay, I, I, I'm, uh, because I want to do localization, which means that I already have a map, and I want, so I'm, I'm staying in this position, and then uh, I want to go to one point on the map in that direction, and then you could go towards that. So then, in this moment, uh, I have a map, and during my, uh, uh, movements now. I use my map, uh, like, like uh, localization algorithms, visual localization to recover my localization, uh, to determine where I am. And then at some moments, now, suddenly, like uh, the localization lost, then I need to recover that. Yeah. So the features are uh, based on map. Yeah, exactly. So I have one question about your uh, evaluation uh, behavior. Uh, you know, you use data to Oh, right, right, that's it, okay. Uh, so currently, yeah, no, yeah, I can, we, can do, no, we cannot do that. So actually we are, we are working on using, for example, using sound uh, like sensors to do that. The sound sensors, you can uh, get some, like, uh, you can train uh, like a model to know, okay, where is the, 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 the so where there is some obstacle there. Uh, the sound sensor can, can allow you to do that. And actually the sound sensor can allow you to uh, roughly estimate uh, uh, where is the obstacle. And then you can add that prior into your model, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, we don't need to have uh, like uh, like a broader camera. Uh, the, the reason is that uh, so you may you may wonder okay, how can we uh, recover these kind of like feature vectors, right? Uh, the reason is that so uh, so first of all, like I have only one camera which has only like look ahead. Okay. However, uh, I can always, uh, because I can have one policy which can guarantee uh, both safety and also I can collect uh, sufficient information. And then I can stay in place. I can just uh, turn around. Okay. So then I can wait for a moment now, like for other people to go around. So, so I, we will always uh, maintain some like uh, uh, uncertainty level to determine okay, whether I have sufficient information uh, to estimate uh, this kind of uh, uh, flow velocity. Uh. If I don't, then I can stop and uh, stay there, and then I can uh, let the human go through, and then I can uh, collect all the information uh, necessary for the, to recover the, 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 the flow vector. Oh, so it's real time. Uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, right, right, right. So this is, uh, you can just put that inside, inside the flow, and then it can do everything, like, uh, because it can do the mapping and the localization, and then it can do everything like, by, by itself. Uh, not yet, yeah, not yet, yeah. So we were, we're not doing that now, yeah. Uh, so currently the, the extension, with what we're doing is that now we, we want to combine the like, bird view camera and uh, the, our like, local things together. This is possible. Basically, we can train the relationship between the bird view and the, like, uh, like, the local camera together and to see what is, uh, how, whether we can predict uh, the bird view uh, image uh, from the local image. That is possible. So, this is, then you can get some estimation, and then, then, then you can do that faster, rather than like stay there and wait. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so my last question is oh. that, like, uh, to just be able to like, uh, assimilate the idea, can I draw an analogy like, uh, the way a particle filter relies on the static object in the object, right? So this is, this is more like a particle filter that is now able to work with moving objects. Right, 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 exactly, yeah. So basically, is, uh, the particle filter here is that, okay, so because we, <laughs> exactly, so, here we, are, we don't use any features about the static obstacles. We only use the features about the, the, uh, the, the moving obstacles. 
uh, I think your further question may be, uh, how can we combine them together, right? So it's possible, sure. Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, the difficulty is that uh, how can you switch anyway? So when to use uh, or how you can fill them together? Yeah. So this is uh, not a uh, trivial task, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so we don't know. So uh, during the training, indeed. Uh, so that's so in the beginning. I think I mentioned like why we first start from a toy like uh, uh, like the scenario and then go further. Uh, uh, so because uh, we found that if we just uh, Uh -huh. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, okay. I see, I see, I see. Uh, so for that part, uh, um, so first of all, so currently uh, in our local collision avoidance, uh, we only consider the uh, how to avoid uh, the collision with the uh, moving obstacles. So the collision or not is our uh, top priority. So if you only consider that, uh, then the collision, if you just, uh, because the collision avoidance is uh, completely local uh, like behavior, so you can indeed separate that uh, from the entire pipeline. That is uh, okay. However, if your question is that, uh, for example, if you add some preference uh, into the Pipeline. So, for example, now, so there are humans that uh, come to you, and there are different uh, like objects, and you want, uh, for example, you want to keep robots now uh, further from the human uh, rather than to some static objects. So, in this way, now, uh, indeed, uh, in our current uh, work, now uh, we cannot do that. However, however, uh, our uh, recent uh, future work actually is uh, trying to solve that. The basically, is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, we can maintain some like uh, like the cost map around you. And then this cost map can encode all the information uh, about your preference, about all the context, about all the like environments and uh, like uh, sem semantic uh, information. And then you can uh, use this cost map and then uh, use that uh, in the, for example, in training. And then you can uh, get uh, some, 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 something which can consider. Uh, because you can uh, use this cost map as one input to the controller. And then controller can uh, consider that. Yes. Yeah, so then you can par partially resolve the, the, this kind of like, uh, you mentioned that the, the local minimal problem, yeah. Oh, oh, the last one, okay. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, uh, no, we only consider the, the deform object as some point cloud. Okay, yeah, so we don't consider any like dynamic features. Like, uh, for example, I think, I think uh, the dynamic dynamics feature you mentioned is some like, uh, like for example, sheets or something like that. Does that mean? Yes, even though they are dynamic, I mean, even though they are deform cloud, there's my, right, right. So, so, for example, some sheets, uh, there's some like uh, geometric uh, constraints now, uh, like uh, which is global. Right, uh, right, 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 right. So, yeah, we we can consider that. So that's why we uh, our work only uh, work uh, here for the for the like closed because closed is uh, kind of very very soft and you don't have such kind of uh, structure there. Yeah. So if you want to extend that to the, for example, much harder like a steel sheet. Then of course uh, you you need to add these kind of structural information like from the mechanics uh, inside that, and then you can do that. Yeah. Uh, oh okay. Uh, regarding the navigation to the crowd again, so uh, I think uh, when you train the uh, when you train the controller, uh, you assume that uh, all the agents execute. When you use reinforcement uh, to train the controller, you all the agents execute the same controller. In the right.
Uh, right, right, right. We, 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 we think about that before. So, um, so uh, our current solution actually is that uh, so you first uh, train the policy in the simple scenario, and then uh, if you basically is give the robots some very fundamental uh, poly, uh, capability, and then you can, uh, for example, train some special scenarios like uh, using the cars or other things, and then you can uh, respond to the, enable the robots to respond to these uh, non-homogeneous uh, robots, and then hopefully that you can uh, update your policy uh, from there, and then to to get a better policy to deal with that. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, exactly. So uh, no, basically, it's not some, uh, OK. In our work, actually, we don't have like some, 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 some idea like uh, to extract the features of, or extract some agents. Uh. So everything is just some like, uh, like point data, like point sensor measurements uh, in the environment. Uh. So just uh, every person is, uh, the person is made by some sensor measurement points inside the environment. So everything is uh, some sensor measurement. So there's no, there's no like concept of agent. And then we consider everything uh, like same. So we don't, uh, so in our full work actually is that, okay, I have a 30 degree or like uh, 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 a vector of sensor measurement. And for different uh, sensor measurement points, you have different uh, weights, like uh, to indicate uh, like what is uh, uh, the collision avoidance preference or what is uh, uh, some context information. So then we just use that uh, for, for collision avoidance. Uh, so basically we will add some uh, intermediate level to predict uh, these kind of uh, like additional features. Yeah. So, so for your, your RL agent, only input the current measurement of the LiDAR sensor? Oh, no. Uh, we can current, uh, we just input, uh, I think at this moment we in input three, uh, three frames. Yeah. Because otherwise you cannot predict the velocity and acceleration. Yeah. Uh, you can use more. So, for example, use the particle. Like a, what was a particle IN, right? So you can also do that anyway to add more like uh, information to that. Yeah. So we have tried that. Uh, we, we tried IN before anyway. So uh, uh, at least uh, for our task, it seems it does not provide too much improvement. Uh, the reason may be because uh, uh, it is too responsive. So you only need uh, like a few frames. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no. So basically, is uh, uh, for the safety one, it is a uh, very very conservative. Uh, I think it may be able to finish the task, but it is very very slow, and it can get stuck, right? And uh, for the uh, PID one, uh, it will collide. Anyway, there's no guarantee for the, for the collision. Okay. Yeah. So basically, my concern is that uh, when you show the result, when you say, OK, we want the uh, agents are not close to each other, you use a PID policy, mm -hmm. you use green, and then right. you do that, and then they become red, and they become blue, then the return becomes red. I'm concerned that when you are doing this experiment in the real uh, scenario, mm -hmm. not the, the other agents are not following the same policy. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we do this for the, for the warehouse, for the real multi-robots. So uh, for example, robots uh, with different shapes, uh, uh, different dynamics. Uh, uh, indeed, there will be something like that. Uh, yeah, but uh, you, you can always tune the parameters because, uh, because that the, the hard, so even though we learn the hybrid control, but uh, you can also do the traditional hybrid control to design some parameters to, to, to switch uh, like the manifold and so on and so forth, yeah. And uh, for the real experiments uh, in the human, uh, environment, uh, it is difficult to do that anyway because uh, you know so so uh, yeah only one of them only one only the robots is the robots and uh, for the, for humans we don't know yeah exactly so so because I think there is some open open question there like for example uh, like because the robots uh, will avoid the humans 
the humans will also avoid the robots, and then there is a very complicated uh, interaction there, and then how to do that. So our current solution is that, okay, you just follow the human flow, and then to minimize uh, this, this kind of disturbance, and then, uh, so then you can minimize this kind of problem, yeah.